So presenting now after the break is uh, William from Polygon Zero, who will be selling us Apple's new AirPods Pro. Oh, sorry, I mean, uh, generalizing air to multivariate domains. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Will. Uh, I work at Polygon Zero. And today I'm going to talk about a project of mine called AirPods, which is about generalizing air to multivariate domains. So let's get some notations out of the way. Uh, I'm going to work over a field F, large enough for security. Uh, I'll have traces, which length is n, a power of 2. Um, so n is 2 to the v. Um, I'm assuming that uh, F has a subgroup, multiplicative subgroup H of size n, and here's the vanishing polynomial over H. Um, this set 0, 1 to the v, I'm going to call the cube of a dimension v. And at some point, I'm going to use this multilinear function beta, which interpolates the equality over the cube. So beta x, y is 1, if and only if x equals y. Great. So the genesis of this work is uh, R1CS. So when you have a R1CS instance, um, First thing you do is you transform it into polynomials. And then you have two paths. Either you interpolate um, the polynomials into univariate polynomials, um, and then you get stuff like Marlin, which uses a univariate sum check argument. Or you can interpolate them as multivariate polynomials, and you get something like Spartan, um, which uses a multivariate sum check argument. And so my question was, can we do the same for error-like arithmetizations? And by error-like, I mean error, so stuff like in Starks, but also uh, Planck. And so how it goes now is we have error. We transform it uh, into a problem about polynomials. Um, if we go with univariate polynomials, we get classic Starks and Planck. But what if we want to use multivariate polynomials? As far as I know, like, nobody has worked on that. And like, the question is, what would fit in this picture? OK. So first, I'm gonna, before error, I'm going to start with uh, a simple arithmetization. Um, it's quite useless, but it's a good uh, warm-up. Uh, we have a n by k table of field elements. We have a polynomial constraint over k variables, uh, whose degree is quite small, much smaller than n. And then we ask that the constraint evaluates to 0 on every row of the table. So here you can already see that why it's very useless, because you could just have the same row over and over again. Um, but how, how would we prove um, this fact, right? So you could just give the table, but that would be too large. So like, we want like, a succinct proof that we know a table um, that satisfies that. Um, so if you choose to use univariate polynomials, you interpolate the columns as polynomials of degree less than n. Um, you compute this composition polynomial, f, which is just the constraint evaluated at all the column polynomials. Uh, then you can prove that uh, this polynomial vanishes on the subgroup H. Okay. This is equivalent to just saying that the constraint evaluates to 0 on every row. Um, and this implies that um, Z of H divides F, and we call Q the quotient. Um, then you commit to all the polynomials. Uh, you send them to the verifier. Verifier sends you back a challenge Z. And then uh, the verifier checks this identity. And to check this identity, you have to open your polynomials at Z. Okay? That's where you use your polynomial commitment scheme to open it. You send everything to the verifier. The verifier checks the opening proofs and this equality. Great. So that's very similar to what's done in Planck and Starks, for example. Now, what if we wanted to use multivariate polynomials? Well, this time we interpolate the columns as multilinear polynomials. Um, we commit to them and send them to the verifier. Then we consider this vanishing polynomial P. So it looks a bit scary, but really, uh, if you look into the sum, all the C of F1 to Fk terms are zero. Okay? And so this polynomial is actually the zero polynomial. So we actually want to prove that it's the zero polynomial to the verifier. And by a standard argument, you can do that by just proving that it evaluates to zero at a random point T. Okay? Um, then that, that would apply that P is zero with high probability. Okay, so you ask the verifier for a challenge T. You do a sum check protocol. So P, uh, as um, the form is like a sum over the cube, so you can do the sum check protocol. And then at the end of the sum check protocol, you have this final ev evaluation over a point Z. And uh, the verifier has to evaluate um, this expression. And for that, we have to open the F polynomials at Z. All right. So we can see it's, it's very similar between univariate and multivariate. The only difference is that in the univariate case, we use this quotient trick. And in the multivariate case, we use this trick using the, the beta polynomial. 
Great, so now we can go um, to R. R is extremely similar to um, the previous arithmetization. Only difference is that now we consider windows of two contiguous rows. Okay. So now we have a constraint over 2k variable. And we ask that the constraint evaluates to zero when evaluated on the i row and the i plus one row. Okay. So that's just basic error. We can easily extend error. Uh, for example, we can ask to, instead of looking at the next row, we could look at the next next row, or like the kth next row. Um, another extension could be to uh, look up a constant row in the trace. So like at every um, row, we look at the i row and the nth row. Okay? And these extensions can be combined, right? So like for simplicity, I've only considered polynomials over 2k variables, but you could have like much um, more complicated constraints. So how do we prove error? This is what's done in Starks or Planck. It's extremely similar to what was done before. Only difference is that in the composition polynomial, now we have um, this term f of g x. So this is actually the same as taking your column, shifting it by one, and interpolating it. Okay? You can prove that it's the same as doing f of g, of x, g times x, where f is like the, the column polynomial. The reason is um, if you evaluate this at g to the i, you get f, to the f of g to the i plus 1, which is what you want, like the next value of f. And otherwise, everything is the same until the last check, where this time the last check also includes terms like f of g times z. And for that, we have to open our polynomials at g times z. So we open them at z and g times z. All right, and so that's, yeah, that's basically Starks. Um, now, what if we wanted to do that with multivariate polynomial? Is it that easy to? Um, the answer is no, because here we have the term g times x, which doesn't really make sense, because x now is like a multivariate. It's like x1 to xk. So multiplying by g doesn't really make sense. And if you try to look into like how would you do it, it turns out that, I mean, at least I don't know like how you would do it um, by just trying to take the previous protocol and um, transforming it for error. Okay. So we need to generalize a bit. Um, I'm going to generalize using something I call endomorphisms, which is basically just functions from the set with n elements to itself. One example of an endomorphism is the shift, which takes um, i to i plus 1. Um, and so if we consider any endomorphism sigma, so just a function from n to n, we can have this new arithmetization that I call sigma r, where this time we have our constraint um, looks at the i row and the sigma i row. Okay. So how does it look in practice? If we set sigma as the shift, we get back a regular r, right? Um, if we want to use the kth next row, that's equivalent to setting sigma is shift to the k. So shift to the k just sends i to i plus k. Okay. Uh, if we want to use the nth row, that's like the same thing as setting sigma is constant at n, the function that sends everything at n. And so we have tons of choices for sigma n to the n. So which choices of sigma make sense? Which choices of sigma can you use to like actually build a real protocol? Um, and we can actually classify them. We have this theorem that says that the proving system for error can be adapted to sigma error if and only if sigma can be extended to an affine function. This shouldn't make too much sense for now because sigma is a discrete function. So what does it mean for it to be extendable to an affine function? Um, you can define it in full generality, but I'm only going to talk about like h and the cube. Um, over h for univariate polynomials, we look at sigma as a function from h to itself. And we ask for an extension sigma bar from the field to itself, um, such that sigma bar has the form ah plus b, okay? so just an affine function. Now, for multivariate, um, in the multivariate domain, we consider sigma as a map from the cube to itself, and we ask for an extension sigma bar from f to the v to f to the v, such that sigma bar is a function of the form ax plus b, where a is a matrix and b is a vector. Okay? So we get some linear algebra in the picture somehow. OK, now we have a sigma arithmetization. We assume that the, this condition of linearity is satisfied. 
how do we uh, prove it in the multivariate domain? Well, we can just take the previous protocol and just modify it very simply. Uh, in this P of T polynomial, we just add the, the variables f of sigma x, which now makes sense because sigma is a map from the cube to itself. And in the last step for the evaluation, we open our polynomials at z, but also sigma bar of z. Okay, again, this makes sense because sigma bar of z, sigma bar takes like uh, elements of f to the v to f to the v. So everything makes sense. And with this linearity condition, you can actually prove that this proving system works. Good, so that's all very abstract. So like, what kind of sigmas can you actually choose in practice? So in the univariate case, um, you can actually prove that the only sigma that work are the shift to the k and the constant at k, okay? So it turns out that the extensions I of error I mentioned before are actually the only extensions you can do. Yeah, it's just like looking up the kth next row or looking up a constant row. You cannot do anything else if you want to keep the same um, base proving system. And if you count how many sigmas you, you, you how many sigmas that that amounts to, uh, there's like two n and n of which are bijective. Uh, what about the multivariate case? You can also like classify them in full generality, but like here an example is, is much simpler. Um, here's like an example of a matrix A and vector B that works. Um, and what they do, if you do AX plus B, it just, per, it just do a permutation of the coordinates. You bit shift some of them, and then some of them you can also set to constant, if you want. Okay? And that's actually like all that you can do, like uh, in all the sigmas that you can do is like basically that, just permuting the coordinates and bit shifting some of them, and if you want, like set some of them to constant. And if you count, how many uh, sigmas you, you get by doing that. Um, you get like these expressions. Um, and then you can see, uh, if you compute how many that is, that it's quite larger than what we got uh, in the univariate case. So in some sense, by going to the multivariate domain, you get like more degrees of freedom uh, in your arithmetization. Cool. Um, right, so like how does it look in practice? Um, so you've chosen your sigma, you want to do like error on multivariate domains, um, and then you get something that I call error pods. You have your original table, n by k, your n by k table, and your sigma. You don't really know what sigma does, but like you can actually split your table into a bunch of smaller subtables on which sigma acts as a shift, okay? So all these tables will be, you will get back actually um, original error. So like, in the original error, you just have sigma is the shift. So like by using this new sigma, you just get like a bunch of smaller errors. Um, so that's a bad news in some sense because um, if you want to do like a large uh, sequential computation, um, you won't be able to do that because the largest um, table size will be like much smaller. But you can actually do, use that to do like in some sense errors in parallel, okay? So you just have a bunch of errors of tables in parallel that you can just prove into like one uh, protocol using multivariate polynomials. Great. Um, so um, to conclude, um, to the best of my knowledge, it's like the first error-like arithmetization uh, that works with multivariate domains. Um, I've only focused on like H and the cube today, but like this can be generalized to domains in between. Uh, there's some compromise there, but like it could be like faster. Uh, all of these can be generalized to um, arithmetizations like Planck. Okay? So Planck is basically just error with a permutation argument. So like you can see it's uh, very, you can very easily extend everything to Planck. Uh, none of this requires FFT. Okay? So you can work over any field, um, including fields that don't have a high to the to adicity. Um, and I don't have an implementation yet, but I'm working on it. Um, all right. That's all right for today. Um, I'll take any questions. Cool. Thank you, William. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh. So hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, as you were talking, I was wondering what the utility of this is, and you earlier mentioned something about parallelization. So what do we get out of something like this? So 
So I guess it's like, this work is like much more of an exploration of what we can do with error, right? So like error and Planck is like two years old now, um, the, and it works with univariate polynomials, but like what if you really want to use multivariate polynomials? What if you want to take advantage of the fact that you can work over any fields, right? So I don't know like how it could be used yet, but like let's say you want to, you, there's like a new polynomial commitment scheme over multivariate polynomials that comes out, and that's like much faster than what's uh, currently available, then you could use this new arithmetization in your protocol. Okay, thank you. There. I guess I'll do it. Uh, have you considered using a higher individual uh, degree and exploring trade-offs in number of variables and uh, degree of the multivariate polynomial? Uh, can you repeat that, please? Yeah, so you use um, a polynom multivariate polynomials of degree one, multilinear polynomials. Have you considered using a bigger uh, degree and reducing the number of variables? Yeah, yeah, so like that's the, um, this uh, second point here. So like, yeah, you could actually generalize this to work in between, like kind of like compromise between the degree of the polynomials and the number of variables. Yeah, that's totally doable. And you get, you get like the same kind of uh, linearity constraints. Thanks. Are there any last questions? I certainly have one, if there are no more. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I do have a question. Ha what's the intuition behind uh, only the specific endomorphisms that you allowed? Like, why is that the case? Why right. can't you generalize to more uh, so, affine functions? Yeah. So the thing you need is that f of sigma x, so like if f is a degree n polynomial, or like less than n, you want f of sigma x to still be degree n. Uh, and like, so like if you, if you have sigma is x squared, that won't work. So like you need like something like linear or affine to keep yeah. like the degree less than n. Got it. So it, so it needs to be degree conserving, which is exactly why. Or yeah. Bounded. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Thank you. Any last burning questions? If uh, not, then I guess we'll continue on to our next speaker.